read his whole resume or not. He, he says emphatically, no, it's a great temptation, of course, <laughs> because, because it captures very nicely a, a, a range of interests uh, uh, which are uh, important to uh, your understanding him. But many of you know him already. Uh, he's a graduate uh, of the Virginia Military Institute. Um, institutions which are going through great change, that in itself would be a topic uh, uh, of interest. Uh, he's a graduate, a master's degree, I believe, from uh, uh, Georgetown, and, uh, and of course, uh, a PhD, I believe, from SICE. Was Bob Osgood there during those years? Yeah. Bob Osgood is, if you like academics, uh, Bob Osgood was one of the giants of, uh, of international affairs and one of the most decent of human beings. And if you re root for, uh, uh, for those kind of individuals, whenever you think of SICE and think of someone like Bob Osgood, it's, uh, it's an encouragement. Uh, but in any case, a comment on your institution. Uh, Dr. Anthony is the uh, founder and longtime president of the uh, National Council on U.S.-Arab Relations. He's the, uh, has headed a number of other institutions. He's uh, founded and he's also served uh, in a variety of institutions dealing with the Middle East. He's been honored in a variety of ways uh, by the members of the Gulf Council and other leaders in, uh, in that part of the world. He brings expertise that is based upon not only serious scholarship and a number of uh, books which he has written, but also the expertise that comes from long-standing uh, associations and deep friendships uh, with people in that part of the world. Uh, those of you who have heard him speak uh, uh, will certainly uh, uh, remember that, and there's no need for me to comment uh, upon that. The topic for this evening, as you know, is changing U.S. interests and uh, resulting policies in the Gulf area. It's my very great pleasure and with great, a great deal of interest and anticipation that I introduce to you Dr. John Duke Anthony. Thank you very much, Dr. Bird. And it's nice to see such a nice turnout uh, this evening on an issue of some compelling interest to our country and to those who live in Baltimore. I have a, a special pride of place with regard to the city here and its institution. <clears throat> Indeed, I uh, owe it a debt of uh, gratitude that I could never possibly repay as a student uh, in the Johns Hopkins University family and for a long time also on its uh, faculty and involved with its uh, PhD programs and those who were presenting their credentials for the doctoral degree. It's also uh, particularly uh, warm to me because of former Governor Schaefer. <clears throat> and he came to me uh, right after the liberation of Kuwait and the reversal of Iraq's aggression in 1991 and asked could we work together to try to rebuild Kuwait. <clears throat> and he went out on a limb and it was the first, he was the first a uh, national leader with state assets uh, to offer uh, the dedication of one of the piers here in, in uh, Baltimore Harbor for the resupply, the restructuring, and the re-equipping <coughs> of a people <coughs> who had been more than invaded and more than occupied, but uh, literally uh, erased from the map. Um, and he and I were on the first uh, civilian plane that uh, went into Kuwait uh, upon the reversal of Iraq's aggression there. So he's uh, left his stamp, his imprint, his big footprint on this state in this particular uh, city. And then within six weeks uh, to come and work with uh, 48 physicians uh, at Johns Hopkins uh, to help to train them in terms of cultural uh, sensitivity for their venture which would be to try to measure the degree of trauma among children in Kuwait <coughs> who had lived under the invasion and occupation for those seven very brutal and bloody uh, months. So this is a city <coughs> unlike others in our country with regard to the region that I've been asked to address uh, this evening. 
and although uh, have cast their remarks in the light of the changing nature of American interests in the Persian Gulf and the implications of those changes and those interests for U.S. policies, there is a, an extraordinary degree of continuity of those interests. And what I would propose to do is to uh, offer or lay before you a framework, a construct, uh, from which we can build as a foundation for a discussion and questions and answers and differences of, of viewpoint. Uh, certainly for a half century now, there have been uh, constants with regard to the American interest in this particular region. Throughout uh, the uh, security of, of Israel, its survival, its protection, has been an ongoing American interest, unbroken through 10 administrations, from Truman to, to Clinton, five Republicans, uh, five uh, Democrats. Uh, this is the evidence uh, to show how bipartisan <laughs> that national conviction, that national commitment has been and remains to this day. Uh, but secondly, because of that particular region's uh, control over the resources of a particular commodity uh, that is vital not just to our material well-being and industrial uh, strength, but to that of, of all humankind, uh, the interest of having access to the region's hydrocarbon resources. Uh, at the time, in the beginning, it was to its petroleum resources, but increasingly it is also to its uh, gas resources. And then for the longest time, until the last uh, decade, uh, roughly a decade before now, it was to prevent the Soviet Union, uh, in terms of the Cold War, uh, from making inroads into that particular region that would hurt our friends, our allies, and our, our partners. That's the overarching element of, of interest that had been constants, and whereas the Soviet Union, of course, is no longer an international player or an entity unto itself, uh, the challenges that the Soviet Union made to that region, the threats, the intimidation, the, the motives, the intentions, the objectives, uh, have been replaced by two other countries right in the region, namely I Iran and Iraq. So there's been a constancy, though once removed from the original uh, concern and fear. Then there's been a second tier of interests, which, though one might not call as vital as those first three, have certainly been constant and major or very important, or at least we put italics around them and neonize them and capitalize them. And these would have to do with the six countries whose sovereignties we were able to ensure and whose political independence we were able to safeguard and whose territorial integrity we were able to uh, see remain intact. Namely, Kuwait, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, and Oman. They grouped together in 1981 in May as the Gulf Cooperation Council, a regional forum uh, within which, through consultation, they seek to achieve consensus on a uh, range of sub-regional specific issues, whether it's oil or economic or social development or technology or joint ventures or foreign investment. Uh, this is uh, a group of six countries that are hardly marginal. Indeed, of all places in the world where we have mobilized our troops and expended more of our troops and treasure in the last decade and a half, uh, there isn't any other area than this one, where in the first case, to bring an end to the Iran-Iraq war, we dispatched 55,000 of our best and brightest uh, men and women in what was largely a success story because it not only prevented the Iranian revolution from expanding to the western side of the Gulf, but it also <laughs> brought about an end to one of this century's longest and most brutal and bloodiest and nastiest of wars between Iran and Iraq. And in the process, it made a contribution to bringing the Soviet Union to the decision to withdraw its troops from neighboring uh, Afghanistan. Uh, but barely uh, months later, 
Here we were uh, projecting 590,000, 10 times as many, to try to reverse the Iraqi aggression. And although there's much difference of viewpoint and opinion as to whether we did the right thing at the right time for the right reasons, in the right place, uh, with the right people, I'm one of those who unabashedly acknowledges <coughs> that uh, largely what we did was the right thing. Uh, we restored uh, freedom to the people of Kuwait in their safety and security. We restored the internationally legitimately recognized government of Kuwait. We reversed aggression. We upheld for one of the few times in this second half of the 20th century the UN preamble charter of the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by force. We upheld the Vienna Conventions regarding diplomatic and consular security and safety, which had been brutally uh, ravaged. And we put in place a, an agreement that has no precedent in history or any other international organization or any two other countries in the world, namely a, a border that is guaranteed uh, by an international organization, the UN Security Council, the border now between Kuwait and Iraq. Uh, so these are my takes on that particular aspect, on the constant aspect. We look at the uh, second tier of the importance of this region and its peoples and its economies to our peoples. This region, your economy, <coughs> our country's economy, in terms of jobs, in terms of investments, in terms of money for uh, research and development, in terms of exports, in terms of our balance of payments, in terms of our monetary and fiscal policies, in terms of interest rates, in terms of our budget, uh, in terms of something upon which we can anticipate, we can plan, we can predict. Uh, these six countries that I've just listed have largely been in that particular column uh, that have allowed us to move forward. Uh, and we have had a reciprocity of interest, a complementarity of interest, need, fears, and concerns. And at the end of the day, there's been a mutuality of benefit. For the most part, uh, the critics and the pundits who disagree notwithstanding, uh, these are moderate countries. Uh, that is to say, the, uh, there's not uh, a radical or militant or fanatic or an extremist or fervent zealot among any of their decision makers yet. And therefore, these are the kinds of people that one wants as partners, as friends, as allies uh, for predictability's sake. And perhaps they are not at all in the majority with regard to either the underdeveloped countries or the Arab countries or the Middle East or the Islamic world. But these are six that we will be speaking about this evening. We now have a commercial interest with these countries that uh, did not exist uh, 20 years ago. Then it was just the economic aspect of the access to their oil. Uh, but some $27 billion of, of uh, trade goes between the United States and these uh, countries. It's one of the few regions and sub-regions of the world where we have a, a positive balance of payments more years than we do not. And what few Americans are, are aware is uh, that all of these countries uh, denominate their exports in the American dollar. Many people criticize them for that and say that this <laughs> makes you look like America's Arabs or uh, uh, some Levantine lackeys there or the running dogs of imperialism, the language of the 50s and the 60s there, which they, they have thrown at them. Uh, but this is one of the keys to the ongoing stability, acceptability, respectability of the dollar at currency worldwide, and it is linked to the ongoing preeminence of American financial systems worldwide. What I'm sketching out here is a different region, a different sub-region of what usually passes for conventional wisdom in terms of the Arab countries, the Middle East, uh, and the Islamic world. We had a statement that appeared on so many bumpers in 1992 it's the economy, stupid. And we used to all laugh and giggle a little bit at that, and that seems to have been the telling difference in the victory of one and the defeat of the other. But I uh, reflected on that the first time I, I saw it, and I thought, well, if, if education and insight and uh, analytical uh, profundity were the objectives, uh, a better bumper sticker would have been, it's the energy, stupid. All economies run on energy, rich and poor, old and new and small and big. And in this particular case, a few statistics might be of uh, relevance and bear keeping in mind for our discussion, because no one need to be 
you need be defensive or unabashedly apologetic uh, about our dependence upon this resource. Uh, it, it, it is true, it is uh, realistic. We are more dependent upon it than any other peoples in the world, any other peoples in history, any other country among the more than 200 countries in the world. And if one says the air that we're breathing at the moment and the food uh, that we've had today and the water are all vital things, I would challenge anybody to name the fourth most vital commodity upon which all of humanity lives and survives. Uh, than energy, and particularly uh, the oil of that region. And the Persian Gulf itself has just under 70 percent of all of the known petroleum reserves in the world. Uh, we have uh, around two and uh, three quarters percent. So that region has something like 25 times uh, what we have. Although we're only six percent of the world's population, we consume 40 percent of its uh, natural resources annually. Uh, these are uh, figures that have their own implications for U.S. interests and U.S. policies. We produce now about 8 million barrels a day most days out of the year. Let's just take one of the six countries, Saudi Arabia, because it also produces each day around uh, 8 million barrels a day. But ponder the following and the implications of the following if you were a decision maker, if you were a policy maker, if you were an opinion formulator, if you were an options formulator there. We get our 8 million barrels of oil a day from some 650,000 oil wells, every single one of them driven by a pump. Saudi Arabia gets its 8 million barrels a day of oil from fewer than 900 wells, none of them driven by a pump. Our problem is when we can find it, getting it out of the ground. Their challenge is when they find it, which is frequent, keeping it in the ground. And theirs is all by pressure. It flows up to, to the surface, and the difficulty is to keep it in the ground, uh, not to bring it out. All of theirs, though, are by, by pumps. The average production of an American well is 14 barrels a day. The average production of a Saudi Arabian well, a Kuwaiti well, an Abu Dhabi well is 12,000 barrels a day. Uh, now, <coughs> what I have to say in these regards go against the conventional wisdom and what would pass uh, for uh, knowledge and responsibility on the current situation in the international energy industry, which posits that the markets for oil in the international sector will remain depressed for some time yet to come, and that this will correspondingly have an enormous impact on the revenues to the governments of the countries in the oil-producing uh, regions. And therefore, the, the salad days are gone for good, and they are not likely to come back. Um, I'm not one of those who uh, believe this. There may be many of you here who are with one of the investment houses in town and advising your, your uh, customers and clients, um, and I'll be happy to go into some details why I'm, I'm not of that view. But largely, it's because of the most recent visit of Crown Prince Abdullah of Saudi Arabia. As you may know, King Fahad of Saudi Arabia, one of the last if not the last, uh, signers of the um, UN Charter. He and two of his brothers, all three of whom became kings, uh, were at the San Francisco uh, conference for the United Nations uh, Charter. Uh, he had a stroke at the end of November 1995, and effectively, on most day-to-day -day governing of the kingdom, it's been his half-brother, Crown Prince uh, Abdullah, uh, bin Abdulaziz Al Saud. Uh, who is to be the heir apparent and the designated successor of King Fahad. He visited the United States uh, in September for uh, several days. And during that time, I don't know if you've read about it, I know uh, Mr. Stern would tell me that the Baltimore Sun reported everything about the meeting. Uh, in terms of his meeting with the CEOs of uh, seven of the biggie uh, oil companies uh, involved in the Persian Gulf. and. Uh, in terms of a train that had been rolling down the track for a long time, he, he in, in essence, invited them all back in to play the role that they used to play before they were eased out. Not nationalized uh, or expropriated like happened in some other countries, but gradually a degree of increasing equity participation and a smooth transition with these companies becoming their, their, their customers and their technology providers there. Uh, this is a major, bold, visionary uh, breakthrough, which has its own implications for our interests and our needs and our concerns, as well as the international economy, 
plus those who may be or were until I made these last few sentences bullish on Central Asia and the Caspian region, uh, which is fraught with far more difficulties and much more costly and has yet to settle either the exit routes or the legal and constitutional regimes that would give one comfort and confidence that their investments could be protected, protected there. So that's just the aspect about energy. But even while the energy aspect has been meeting its own uh, uh, circumstances. Uh, this is also the region of one seventh of the world's known gas resources, uh, which are also become because it's cleaner and in a way it's cheaper. Although you have to spend a lot of money for the ships, and the ships would come from here in Philadelphia and elsewhere that uh, are so costly to take them largely to, to, to Asia and to a degree here to the United States. So these would be in a second category of interest. But amongst the changing ones uh, that we have, and these have been constants there, but with a, a, a more recent refinement, uh, amongst the uh, changed ones are those of, of uh, concern <coughs> over the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Here we're talking about nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, and biological weapons. And both with regard to Iraq and Iran, there is real uh, need uh, for concern there. I don't think uh, most of the people who work on this are exaggerating, and they're not scaremongers. Uh, it is frightening in terms of those two particular countries. Also in the area of terrorism, uh, I Iran is involved in it, has been involved in it, and despite its um, denunciations and uh, denials uh, notwithstanding, uh, uh, the evidence is clear in terms of its uh, ongoing support for groups, institutions, and individuals uh, that uh, do not have the security and the protection of civilians and innocent people uh, on their sleeve, and particularly in terms of the middle of Lebanon with regard to the uh, groups uh, there, the Hezbollah in particular. Uh, that are part of the peace process. So there is a link between the Persian Gulf and this peace process, or the Eastern Mediterranean there that is of some considerable ongoing concern. So that would be a second of the, of the changing ones. And then with this administration, um, more so than the Bush or the Reagan administration, but an echo to a degree of the Carter administration, the issues of human rights and, and as shorthand would be democratization, uh, but there are other ways of wording that without using the D word or the P word, the political word. Uh, and you can come up with the word of increasing the level of popular participation in the national development process. Got a nice ring to it. Good cadence. And you get out of the D word and the P word there, but it shows a forward momentum there. So we are we're, we're involved in all of these issues and particularly looking for stability because in the absence of stability, there can be no investment. Certainly foreign won't come and there won't be much domestic either, and you won't be able to predict or plan. And we've had to mobilize and deploy to this region twice now, and I would say that that's two times too many, and that uh, we need to do all within our power to make sure that we don't have to go a third time. And so much of our negotiations, our diplomacy, our politics, our technology, our meetings, our exercises, our prepositioning of equipment, our undertakings, our access to facilities, and a constant alert with regard to Iran and Iraq are not just for the exercise or the practice of experience and the expertise that would uh, come as a result, uh, but rather to be effective so that no one in Baghdad, no one in Tehran would have any misgiving, any reason to doubt uh, that the United States uh, does not intend to come a third time and that the U.S. does indeed intend to make it very costly, very pricey for either of the two to engage in the kinds of adventurism uh, uh, that uh, brought the region uh, to such turmoil uh, in the last 15 years. So this gives us the parameters and the context for focusing uh, such information and insight and what I may have to offer in the realm of knowledge and understanding uh, this evening. Um, but I would be remiss if I were not to say that all is not well uh, within the region in terms of how its peoples, its leaders, its governments, uh, military and civilian, and economists, and teachers, and people of all ages and backgrounds view our relationship. Um, and, and the long and the short of it <clears throat> is that there is no end of pain in the uh, hearts of uh, the peoples in the region as they look at us and try to fathom why we do what we do in terms of our policies and our positions and our actions and our attitudes. And there are those who have been students here 
and who've traveled here and who read and newspapers and magazines and watch our televisions who would say that there is still a significant amount of religious racism in the United States of America. There is still a matter of pigmentational prejudice. There is still a matter of cultural condescension, if not cultural conflict, between the peoples of the West and the United States in particular, and us. And there is an italicizing of the word us. Now, that is to say, because so many Americans perceive the peoples of that part of the world as they, as them, as other. And this, on the face of it, is, is dehumanizing, uh, especially amongst people who believe uh, that they have every right to be called partners in this relationship, that they share so much in the way of common needs and concerns uh, with the United States, but it doesn't come across in terms of the mainstream American media. I <coughs> hear them, <coughs> if you will, then, through some of my words here, uh, that uh, we are seen as, as objects, objects to be influenced, controlled, and manipulated, more than we are seen as actors, important people to be reckoned with in our own right. We are seen largely as oil wells, not as countries. We are seen as mountains of money, <clears throat> and not as people with extraordinarily deep and rich uh, principles and morals and heritage. Uh, we are seen as uh, endless combinations <coughs> of heat and dust and sand, as opposed to a group of nations that are every bit America's friends, allies, and strategic uh, partners. Uh, that is part of the echo of the pain uh, that <coughs> many would, would express. And in military meetings that I go to with the commander chief of all of our forces in the region, on a regular basis and working with our diplomats and with others who are trying to work our relationship with these countries. Um, uh, it's not far-fetched, these views. Um, they are echoed in the statements and the questions of the people I work with in our government, um, mostly out of ignorance. Uh, but with the ignorance comes no end of arrogance. Uh, it's not all malice aforethought as such. Uh, only a minority would be in this regard. But on the positive side, uh, we're talking not about Paraguay or Uruguay or Mongolia, and I mean nothing disparaging by saying that we're not talking about those three, but we're talking about something quite special to every one of us, I would think, in this room, or certainly the overwhelming majority of us, if not uh, the bulk of humankind, in terms of uh, sympathy and empathy and understanding of the quintessential importance of this particular region. Uh, we're talking, for example, about at the crossroads of civilization, of uh, Judaic, Christian, and Islamic uh, culture. And we're far more indebted to the, the third I just named for a more intensive and extensive period than most of us would acknowledge, certainly from 711 AD until 1492, which had two big dates, not just Christopher Columbus there, <laughs> but the other rather ugly date, namely the Inquisition and the expulsion of all Jews and Muslims from uh, the Iberian uh, Peninsula, who ran not so much to the north or to the east or to the west, but uh, back to the, the Middle East, to the Islamic world there. Uh, from that particular uh, period in terms of the, the richness of these three monotheistic faiths, uh, it is the crucible of, of cultures, as the, the Western world uh, knows culture, uh, the anvil of antiquity, uh, the source of sunshine <coughs> on the classical world, and you don't have to be John Glenn going into space to recognize that here was where eternity stepped into history. Uh, this is the nursery of, of nations. It's where the first child cried, <coughs> where the first uh, lovers sighed, where the first uh, people died, and where the first people lied. It is also an area of tradition and modernization and constancy and change and cooperation and conflict, old and new, big and small, rich and poor. And it is, above all, in terms of the emotional aspect of human beings and the spiritual ones, too, at the center, indeed at the epicenter, <coughs> of prayer and pilgrimage, of faith and spiritual devotion for more than half of humanity. And so in this aspect of, of the treasures within them, and their role throughout history and our linkage to 
this particular region, whether we're atheists, agnostics, deists, non-practicing believers, um, or whatever our faith may be, Jew, Christian, Muslim, uh, if any of us walked out the street <coughs> this evening and tried to get across and were hit by an automobile and it hurt, and we were laying down and we realized we not only couldn't get up, but we were bleeding profusely and that we would never see a sunrise again or a sunset. I doubt if there's anyone in this room <coughs> who wouldn't cry out, help me God, oh God, help me. And so this aspect, imperceptible but palpable nonetheless, would come full force in terms of what this region <coughs> has been in terms of who we are, what we are, where we came from, and what we're trying to pass on <coughs> to our children here. In this aspect, as the peoples of the region look to build on this usness, this uh, partnership, uh, there is another aspect of pain that I didn't mention before. Uh, we are seen, I think largely unfairly, but the evidence is there to feed the image or the perspective is, in many ways, willfully unfair in terms of duplicity and hypocrisy and moral audacity with regard to standards and the inconsistency of application of principle and what we expect of one people and what we demand of another people, uh, that uh, this aspect amongst people who take notes, who do their homework and do their research, is thrown back at us in ways that we really don't see ourselves, <coughs> even if we look in the mirror and ask, what can we do differently? What can we do better to make our relations with this particular region uh, more successful? We're seen as, as lacking courage, <coughs> and not just the courage of one's convictions, uh, moral courage of doing the right thing in the right way, unapologetically, for the right reasons at the right time, uh, but also lacking um, political and professional, even physical courage, to take the heat of standing above the fray and being de Gaulle-like or Churchill-like or Mandela-like <coughs> to untie this knotty knot with regard to the eastern end of the Mediterranean, that in terms of its manifestations and its effect on our interest is not confined to that region, but spreads indeed to the Persian Gulf, our focus of this evening. Uh, we are seen as a country that has had no druthers putting pressures on these countries to join in with our boycotts in the past of Albania and North Korea and Vietnam and China, uh, but has really laid down the law to many of the countries in the region in terms of their boycott of Israel in occupation of their land. And we are seen as the Olympic champion uh, of boycotts, even while we are pompous and pontificating and posturing against others who would use the boycott or sanctions. We are seen as a country that has, under sanctions, under effective embargoes and boycotts, a significant uh, portion of that region in terms of Iran and Iraq, Libya, Sudan, and Syria. Of the six that are under sanctions, five of them are Islamic countries, four of them are Arab countries, and the only one that's not Islamic or Arab is, is North Korea. Uh, we are seen as extolling and exalting the virtues and values of volunteerism and the virtues and values of a democracy. And yet, by the score that is kept in the region, as Casey Stengel would say, just look it up, we are seen as the country that has subverted, sabotaged the democratic process in the world's highest political organization, namely the United Nations Security Council, more than all the other members with veto powers in the Security Council combined twice over. Uh, this is an objectively, statistically validated uh, fact. Most of us don't know that. Up until 1970, we never once used the veto for anything in the United Nations Security Council. Since then, we've used it for more than 70 times. More than 40 of the 70 times we have used it when there was an overwhelming majority to come out with the rhetoric of an admonitional resolution against something the Israelis did or did not do, or a condemnatory tone to the resolution there. And when we have done this, we have largely been alone except with Israel and with the marshals, the Marianas there. And alone abroad is, is not a place that one would prefer to be 
on issues of such great uh, moment there. So we are seen as being not congenitally, but certainly emotionally, politically, psychologically, socially, culturally uh, tilted uh, towards one of the parties in the Israeli-Palestinian or the Arab-Israeli conflict and not uh, empathetic, let alone sympathetic, uh, to the other party or parties, even though the total number of Jews in the world of, of 15 million, if I use the figures correctly, from the World Jewish Congress, uh, 5 million in Israel itself, and, and 10 million amongst the diaspora. There are 240 million Arabs, 15 million of whom are, are Christians. There are more Arab Christians in um, Maryland and Virginia in the District of Columbia combined three times over. Most people aren't aware of that. And more than a billion uh, Muslims spread amongst some 56 countries that are organized into the organization of the Islamic uh, Conference there. And those figures, those realities, because they're human beings behind each one of those statistics, uh, have their own implications for U.S. policies and positions in national uh, interest. Sometimes we are seen as the, as the world's sole defender of what are alleged to be Israel's violations or transgressions of international law and UN Security Council resolutions. Uh, Resolution 425, for example, of 1978 in Lebanon. I remember when it happened uh, in terms of the call that we voted for ourselves for the immediate uh, withdrawal of the Israeli forces from Lebanon. Here we are in 1998, uh, 20 years later, and no nearer the end of seeing that resolution implemented than we were the day it was passed. Our resolutions 242 and 338 in my work with Ralph Bunch at the United Nations and his indefatigable work to try to get a resolution uh, that would uh, join the need to uh, exchange land for peace and include within it uh, an, uh, an irrevocable guarantee uh, to Israel's security within secure and recognizable uh, borders there. And that we have been the number one veto were of so many of these resolutions and the number one force preventing the implementation of these resolutions is how we're seen, though we do not see ourselves perhaps this way. All the while providing uh, Israel with a degree of economic assistance um, that puts Israel's per capita income at the same as that of those of, of Great Britain. It's not a developing country. It's a, a dynamic, modernizing, highly technologically sophisticated uh, country, even while this other set of statistics uh, takes uh, place here. And then the corrosion or the erosion of morality or courage or conviction or will at the level of ordinary peoples who bringing out the issues <clears throat> that I bring out, uh, fear and cringe for being called anti-Semitic or having the extermination of the Jewish people on their sleeve or not being concerned about the people who had tattoos on their wrist <clears throat> or who are the <clears throat> perished as well as the survivors of Bergen-Belsen and Auschwitz and Treblinka and all the other extermination camps there. So this intimidation, uh, this um, pressure uh, has its own toll on freedom of speech. I've taken 92 congressional leaders to the region. All but 91 have told me horror stories of how they live in fear if they speak the truth, let alone that it's necessary, let alone that uh, we elected these people to speak the truth and follow the courage of their convictions and look out for America's national interest. 91 out of the 92 have told me they would fear for their political life for certainty, and some would fear for their physical safety were they to take this issue on. And so here we are that uh, the Jews of the world have no really greater assurance of security, of safety or protection, <coughs> of, uh, of a legacy <coughs> to leave to their children and grandchildren than when they, the great noble vision and experiment began before the Holocaust and gathered up ahead of steam with the Holocaust and the resettling and the establishment of a Jewish national homeland in Israel. Uh, here we are 50 years down the road 
Are we any nearer than before? I don't think so. And all the spin doctors uh, galore can spin till the cows come home with regard to what happened and what didn't happen at Y Plantation. Uh, but I feel that there's real cause for concern in the land of Israel. With regard to these two countries that are a threat in the Gulf and take such a radical, inflamed at times, position on what I've just been remarking, um, all is not well there either. Uh, here we have again uh, put on notice uh, a head of state who has thrown down the gauntlet at the U.S. policy and the United Nations Security Council. And instead of being certified as having complied, he is in the business of having defied the writ of the U.N. Security Council, now, leaving us dangling as to what to do, because this is not the first time, and there have been several times, and we are caught and trapped in our own rhetoric from the last time uh, that if there wasn't full compliance, uh, it would not stand, and the U.S. would reserve the right to use any means to ensure compliance, <coughs> including the resort to force. And the last time was a very delicately orchestrated event with Kofi Annan and the use of force and diplomacy in the last minute Saddam Hussein blinked. This time we are saying we have more support than before because of the wire plantation, because of the president's investment of an extraordinary amount and degree of political capital for nearly eight days. And that uh, even the Russians and the French are angry at Iraq this time. And so the atmosphere is different. The moment is more propitious than before. Marginally, marginally. Uh, this is a difficult issue. I don't have an answer for it there. But Iraq is one that we're trying to deal with in several different ways. Congress has just appropriate, appropriated, uh, authorized, let's say, uh, appropriated uh, $97 million to support the 42-odd opposition groups to try to be a counter to the regime of, of Iraq. Now, there's also a radio station in Prague that, as we speak, is beaming into Iraq with uh, alternate views of, of, of uh, current events. Uh, the sanctions remain, and these have been uh, both the most successful um, uh, sanctions ever in the history of sanctions, but no sanctions are foolproof, and support for them is waning. And we are finding ourselves bereft of the support that we would need to play the tough role to maintain them as they have been maintained for the past eight years. And the weak ones are China, uh, Russia, and France, and there's no kind word to be said about uh, for those three uh, in circles that I travel in Washington. Uh, but if one is to project oneself empathetically in the shoes of just to say the French of the three, uh, which may be difficult there. Uh, but they, they have a nickname, see, so we could use it to hop into their shoes and souls and situation there. From that, uh, we could leap. Just being facetious here for a moment, see if you were listening. In any case, uh, the French uh, owed $6 billion from the Iran-Iraq war, from Iraq. And they have uh, concluded uh, $6 billion of other agreements for investment, but they cannot come into existence until the sanctions are lifted. And France is roughly one-fourth the population of the United States. So in American terms, that's $48 billion that would be owed to us. Right now, we're not owed a penny by Iraq. What if we were owed $48 billion? What if some of you were owed some of that $48 billion? What if some of you were in investment houses that manage the assets of people who were owed some of that? Would we be the exact same as we are in terms of our positions and principles? Maybe, maybe not. Same thing with regard to Russia, which is heavily owed uh, by Iraq. So there is a, a different material dynamic uh, at play in China, which is uh, with an insatiable appetite for foreign currency. These three look at Iraq quite differently than do we. We, we have only Great Britain with us. Uh, we don't have uh, any other uh, great power as such. In terms of Iran, no end of people um, in investment houses have their bibs on. And um, 
begging bowl in hand, or at least uh, profits and dividends and chattels and mortgages in the background there, looking at Iran as an enormous market that we have uh, embargoed. It's one thing people would say to show a capacity to shoot ourselves in the foot, but for heaven's sake, why do you have to lead also in being able to le reload faster than anyone else? The markets are going not to ourselves at all, uh, but to the British, the French, the Japanese, the Dutch, the Germans, the Italians, the Greeks, and, and, uh, and, and many others there. And we are stuck with our policies of dual containment of both of them and have very little uh, support among our friends and our allies, except that they would hope, in the case of the Europeans and the Asians that I've just mentioned, that we wouldn't lift them, because this is a great American uh, charitable contribution. And it's uh, part of the great American Unemployment Relief Act for much of Europe and, and Asia, if we just would keep those uh, uh, containment things on. These are the aspects of these uh, six countries uh, in terms of the Arab ones who are so small and underpopulated in front of these two. These two are in the business of hegemony in terms of uh, Iraq and Iran, in terms of domination, in terms of prevailing, in terms of persevering. They are also in the mode of resentment and revenge. They resent the fact that both of them have been brought to their deepest, darkest chapters of humiliation in this century in the last 15 years by an internationally concerted coalition of forces led by the United States, but in which these six Arab countries, other than Iraq, uh, stood with the United States and rolled up their slows, uh, sleeves and put their shoulder uh, to the wheel as well. That these countries, which until 20 years ago were poor, smaller, uh, not even well known, uh, certainly not household words, have passed them on the inside lane is, uh, and with and in partnership with the United States is uh, a source of great uh, resentment, that they have higher per capita incomes, that they have social and economic opportunities uh, that put the Iraqs and Iran's uh, to shame, and that there's a quality of life in terms of the environment and the aesthetics in schools and health care systems and roads and airports and seaports that also put anything that Iraq and Iran has also to shame. And so there's the resentment, and then there is the revenge uh, that these countries uh, stood with the U.S. to defeat first Iran, a very proud country, proud people, proud culture, rich culture, and then within less than two years to defeat Iraq. Uh, so these are like ticking time bombs. And what can these countries on the western side of the Gulf do? Uh, altogether, there are only 24 million people. In other words, all six of them combined equal just Iraq's population. Iran has three times as many, so there's no way to close the demographic balance. The army of Iraq, bereft as it is of the expertise in technological military wherewithal as it had before, is still more than triple all of their armies combined. And the same thing with regard to Iran. And these countries, too, in terms of Iraq and Iran, are much more broad-based in terms of their natural resources to plan and predict for the future. These are river societies, Iraq, especially with the Tigris and the Euphrates in Iran to a degree as well. Whereas throughout the entire region from Kuwait, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, and, o and Oman, there's not one single river, not one perennially flowing stream, hardly a lake, barely a pond, scarcely a pool, nary a puddle. Uh, they, they have the energy and not a whole lot more than that, with the exception of Saudi Arabia, uh, which has the uh, industrial uh, wherewithal as a result of starting very early with the uh, vision of King Faisal. I would like to bring these uh, remarks to a, a close here so that we can have some questions and discussion and debate. Uh, but as to the current situation that we find ourselves in, there are a lot of people that want us to hit Iraq and to hit Iraq hard. And make it make it hurt. Uh, interestingly, the two that most want to see that, and I'm giving you my analysis on this, are Iran and Israel. And there are some Iraqis inside Iraq who see that this would strengthen Saddam Hussein, playing more as the victim, more being ganged up by the sole dispensable power on earth along with the agents of the CIA and the $97 billion of the opposition groups uh, being ready uh, uh, to come in. 
Uh, perhaps it's a coincidence that all three of these countries, uh, Iran, Iraq, and Israel, start with the uh, initial I, or the letter I. Uh, perhaps it gives a new meaning to the phrase, the eyes have it. But um, is it in our strategic interest to do something that would uh, strengthen Iran, and so um, weakening further Iraq? It's a question uh, that uh, deserves its own uh, discussion and debate. And is it in our interest to inflame already inflamed passions in the region about what are perceived as the double standard of the United States insisting that each and every one of the resolutions on Iraq be enforced uh, to the hilt? And none to date, not one yet, of the far more numerous passed over far longer time resolutions relating to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. This puts our diplomats in our political, military, and intelligence, and other officials on the line in the region. Uh, the street, so to speak, or the perception is not fully grounded in facts, but the perception uh, is what drives policies. And so this is behind the reluctance, the reservations of people who would want to stand with us. And the, the bottom line is that our policies and positions are seen within the region as having put our friends on the defensive, have, having backed them into a corner, having made them embarrassed, having made them apologetic, at the end of the day, having made them weak. <clears throat> and when our friends are weak, uh, we, too are, we too are weak. I'll take your questions. Thank you. In, in agreement with Dr. Byrd, I've, I've asked if I could do what I did before. Um, I, I was here once previously. It's like being in a university from which there's no graduation. <laughs> oh, and only on the best of days is incomplete. And that's why I'm perhaps back. But I'd like to take several questions at the same time. Uh, and I will repeat the questions for the um, ones who couldn't hear or for the camera. All right, may I try to restate them? The first one. Any ideas I might have uh, to share regarding the U.S. Uh, opening further uh, its uh, overture to Iran uh, in terms of detente, which is what we're trying to achieve, and then after that would be maybe rapprochement. And uh, secondly, uh, what do I have to say about Iran's charm offensive and the other side of the coin of that is, um, might I be a bit heavy on Iran in my remarks because uh, I haven't mentioned the positive aspects of what's come about in, in Iran, certainly since the election of uh, Mohammed Khatimi. Uh, uh, thirdly, uh, comment a little bit on uh, the inconsistency factual and perceived in U.S. policy and its implications for our needs, concerns, and interests. Uh, fourthly, the, uh, what I have to say about the creation of a Kurdistan. I take that to be a, a Kurdish republic or a Kurdish country that's recognized in a member of the United Nations with all the trappings of statehood there. And the last one is uh, anti-Semitism in the context of there being 14 to 15 million Jews worldwide, uh, 240 million uh, Arabs worldwide, and why is anti-Semitism more tilted towards uh, Jews than towards Arabs? Did I get that correct? Even in the language, when we say anti-Semitism, we almost never mean anything but anti-Semitism. Yes, yes, all right, thank you. Um, our opening towards Iran, uh, I'm all in favor of it. I'm, I'm a big booster of diplomacy and dialogue. Uh, and meetings, meetings. Uh, look what happened uh, at Why, even though uh, it's far less than what I think the media has made it out to be, and the spin doctors on the administration side likewise have made it out to be. Uh, you couldn't have even gotten what you got had there not been the meeting. I'm a big booster on meetings. Uh, I think uh, great things uh, occur potentially with meetings, and the great things in life that have occurred have all been through meetings. So if we have issues uh, that concern us, that bother us, that uh, infuriate us, unfinished business with Iran, and we do, on uh, a lot of issues, I mentioned terrorism, weapons of mass destruction, their uh, opposition to the peace process, uh, their uh, unwillingness to play by the rules of international law regarding freedom of navigation, and their pursuit by stealth of uh, weapons of mass destruction in terms of uh, nuclear as well as chemical and bio uh, They have the chemical and bio biological already, but pursuit of the nuclear. Um, I think uh, through uh, dialogue, 
debate, discussion, engagement, involvement, um, we will make progress and very little progress without it. So I'm a big one on that one and I want to see more of it, not less of it. Uh, however, it takes two to tango. And it is true that we have been um, the more energetic and proactive of the two calling for official dialogue with Iran on these issues. And the Iranians, which have their own domestic politics and constituencies to relate to, and other issues uh, different than ours, are not yet ready to take it up to that particular level. But what we have is not ping pong diplomacy as such, but the wrestlers and the, and the visits of academics, this is something, and, I, and I'm, I'm glad for that, but it's not enough. And we come to the second aspect, and this is Iran's charm offensive in the case of Mohammed Khatami, who uh, won the election uh, a year and five months ago. Um, I'm wary of putting so much hope on one person, and if there's been a consistent flaw or uh, almost a seamless flaw in a policy, it has been the degree to which we're enamored of a single individual. I remember reading um, The Ugly American in the 50s, uh, Eugene Burdick and others, and, when, and how we were enraptured with Sigmund Rhee and Ferdinand Marcos, and then later the Shah of Iran, and then Anwar Sadat of, of Egypt there. Um, I think that this is uh, precarious and irresponsible and dangerous. Uh, because they're all uh, one one bullet away from uh, perishing. Uh, but when we haven't had individuals who we found uh, charismatic, mesmerizing, legitimized uh, by their constituencies there, uh, it's been worse. So we're putting it in terms of a glass sort of half full but leaking, as opposed mm -hmm. to a glass <laughs> half full uh, uh, or a glass half empty and, and filling there. At the end of the day, uh, his charm, uh, which is legitimate, uh, has been very well received, and there are no end of boosters uh, throughout the region for him, but he has absolutely no control over the country's foreign policy, its foreign affairs. And so uh, let's, let's not be naive in terms of even what we're hoping this individual could deliver. We're talking about the international bilateral relationship between the two of us. This individual has next to zero uh, uh, control, influence, uh, or uh, input or, or comment, effective comment on that. However, he was elected overwhelmingly by the youth and by women and people who clearly want to open up to the world, not just to the West and not just to the United States. And so he's not out there exactly on a twig at the end of a limb, at the, uh, on a rotten branch. Uh, there is a base underneath him. But that base also is in competition with hardliners who don't want to give up, who don't want to yield, who don't want to give in. And they still uh, wear the mantle of, of old whiskers there, of, of the Ayatollah Khomeini there. And uh, there's been very little change amongst the these uh, individuals in terms of their hardline uh, attitude and policies towards the U.S. And he being one person railing against that, um, it looks precarious, but we wish him well. It's absolutely appropriate that I express our very deep gratitude to you for sharing your wisdom and your time with us this evening. Thanks so Thank much. You.